unbelievable lap record breaking speed. Beautiful conditions, conducive to great pace and the track has got a lot of grip in it at the moment. So our fourth practice session about to get underway. And this is for our co-drivers who are absolutely desperate to get kilometres around here because as you were just discussing on the host desk a few moments ago, no precursor event at Sandown this year. They jump straight into the deep end of the pool to be able to go out and understand how to get the most out of themselves and their cars. So this is a crucial session on a day that may well be weather affected. Shooting for a top temperature of 17 degrees. They're saying somewhere in this district between three to six millimetres of rain today and from one o'clock through until seven o'clock, 30% possibility of thunderstorms. As a friend of mine once described it, that means there's a 70% chance it won't happen, but the possibility lies out there. Virgin Australia track map details now. Let's focus on this location in great detail. So 6.213 kilometres, 6,213 metres of extraordinarily beautiful racetrack. They travel from all around the world to enjoy this place in all kinds of categories of motorsport. 56% of the lap wide open throttle. Slowest corner out there is just 85 kilometres an hour. Top speed, well publicised, 300 kilometres an hour. But the thing that really is extraordinary about this location is just how narrow, just how steep, and just how challenging this location is. Make a mistake here, like we saw on several occasions yesterday, and you will damage a car sometimes beyond repair. So on the subject of Erebus Motorsport, who yesterday had a very difficult day with the Luke Yulden, David Reynolds car, they worked through until the wee small hours in the evening to be able to turn that car around from damage across the top of this hill, where the cars are just under and over. 200 kilometres an hour, approach speed to skyline, 220 k's, and then plunging off the top of the mountain, and the degree of difficulty goes straight up on the run down the hill here. Through the dipper two wheels, building back up to just under a couple of hundred kilometres an hour for the left-hander at Forest's elbow, and then the run down the straight. Wide open throttle portion of this straight is incredibly fast, 300 kilometres an hour, more than 80 metres a second. It's the fastest corner in Australian motorsport, that fast right-hander that takes you down to the braking area. Managing brake temperatures is a big deal here. The brake stress is pretty low, but the temps are high. They cool out, they get hot again, and then they get very hot into the final corner. Oh, we've got a car in the wall. It's the Kostecki car at turn two, is that? So remembering yesterday they had troubles with this car, made contact with the wall at the top of the hill. I think it's Jake in the car out there at the moment. Boost How Mobile supporting this car, and we've got a red flag, so the session is going to be stopped while we understand how to retrieve this car. He's just gone straight in, so is that a brake pressure issue? It wasn't high speed at all. Here we go, this will tell us some of the story. So he's only running along in second gear. Wow. That's quite bizarre. So second gear, super slow, just trying to build brake temperature on a cold tyre. And it looks as simple as though he's just ended up wide of the line there where it's dirty and gone straight in. Unless there was some other failure that we don't understand. So we'll try and get on top of that when they look at the data. But Jake kostecki has gone straight into the tyre bundle at the end of Mountain Straight on the outlap. So it just underscores the degree of difficulty at this racetrack. Year in, year out, people get trapped here. And that's a pretty action-packed location at the best of times. When the cars are at peak speed, they're doing just on 260 kilometres an hour up there in fifth gear. But this is the polar opposite of that. Mark Scapes just wandered back into the commentary box. This is bizarre. It looks like a mechanical failure. It just doesn't look like it even remotely turns right. Oh. It looks like it's it, it, like a bottom arm or a steering arm on the left-hand side or, or a a puncture, he goes to turn right, nothing happens. Yeah, there's a, that's a mechanical failure for sure. Yeah, it no, actually hasn't turned at all, has no, it? No. Yeah, so something very weird has gone on there. So my first suspicion was just he was out on the dirty stuff on a cold tyre, and you know what it's like sometimes, like driving on ice. But I focused on that second replay there on board, and when he's actually put right lock on, nothing happened at all. I thought we going to move one millimetre to the right. Rihanna? Brady Kaseki, sorry, just to oh, interrupt sorry. you there. Uh, yeah. 
just give us an understanding of what happened out there. Yeah, my thought he just went straight out and um, everything felt fine. We made sure Times. that, you know, um, after, you know, a pretty big rebuild for us overnight. Um, it seems to be that power steering's hydraulic, so um, the, the steering wheel was just locked straight, so he, he really couldn't do much about it. So we'll just have to get the car back, try to see what's happened and diagnose it and uh, try, try getting back out there. Was well, it a pretty big build after the incident you guys had last night? Just give us an understanding of the work you had to do. Yeah, it was actually just a lot of bolt-on componentry, so we're pretty lucky in that sort of part of it. So, um, yeah, it's a bit unfortunate, but we'll just have to get the, get, get the car fixed and get it back out there. Thanks for that, Brady. Thank you. A massive amount of work uh, gone on last night here at uh, Penrite Racing, DR. Mate, what an amazing job these boys have done. We see it, we do see it quite often up here at Bathurst. I mean, the, the way the teams come together and, and uh, you know, do such incredible things. This car, uh, she was a bit of a mess yesterday, but she's uh, looking pretty good. Alistair tells me she's uh, pretty nice on the scales too. Yeah, mate, they've done an amazing job. Um, mechanics are funny people, aren't they? They, they almost, do, they wear like a, hang on, what am I trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> they do all nighters and they wear it like a badge of honour. Yeah, they, they do. Yeah, they're, exactly. they're, they're strange people. Yeah. They're, all the bars been replaced. He's all very straight. Um, they were here. I mean, six of your crew have been here all night. They have not gone home. They have no sleep whatsoever. Yeah. Not, not one. Not one bit of wink of sleep. Um, they had six till about. So they had twelve people till midnight, and then six of them went home. They had six basically till now. So. Um, they're just doing the final touches on it and hopefully Luke can get out and make sure it's all right. I'm sure you're going to get out. How's Lukey? Uh, yeah, he's all right. He's um, ready to go. He's all suited up. He, you know, His confidence might be a little bit low, but he just needs to get back in and forget it ever happened. It's, it's challenging, though, because we, we talk about the car a lot, isn't it? But there's such a mental side to this place when everything's going well, regardless of if uh, something's going wrong. Yeah, especially this place. Like, Even if you think you're the king of the mountain like you are, you still need laps, no matter how many... How, no, how, no matter how confident you think you are. So um, he just needs to go back out there and forget it ever happened and get himself back up to speed. Have a great day. Thanks, bro. Just a little bit of an update down here. Macaulay Jones, you can see there, had that unfortunate incident backing it into the wall up there at the cutting yesterday. Now, the issue with this car looked pretty bad, but as we showed you yesterday, a lot of it were just sort of the cosmetic parts, the carbon fibre parts, the expensive parts, though. But the one that everyone asked about, how the hell does the roof come off? Well, these cars aren't like your road car. All the panels aren't welded on. A lot of them are actually pop riveted on, so you can access the chassis quickly. So they didn't have a roof, so they had to sort of just half glue and half pop rivet the one back onto run yesterday. They had to get this flown in from Queensland last night. It's a composite roof, so she's now riveted and glued back on properly. But the car, they're telling me, is actually not quite square. So when they put it on the wheel alignment pad, they're still not quite happy where it is. So a little bit more work to do on this car tonight yet. Thanks for the update, team, from the pit lane in the pit garages down there. Macaulay Jones is just outside that car at the moment. So incredible work by the men and women of all of those race teams. I spoke to Betty Klemenko this morning about the efforts that went on inside her garage and she was just so positive uh, about the, the human aspects of the interaction between the teams up and down the lane and though they fight vigorously on the racetrack and politically behind the scenes, when the chips are down, the teams cooperate with each other. And so she rattled through a list this morning. She said it was pretty much everybody up and down the lane, but Nissan, Walkinshaw, Andretti United, Brad Jones Racing, Tickford, they all jumped in to help and they lent components and they threw people at the problem. So that's an outstanding outcome. And, uh, you know, she was mighty impressed and impressed particularly by the humanity of what went on. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? I mean, you and I talk about it a lot and we've got a very close knit industry and it's the word for it probably is cooperation. So there's a lot of cooperation whilst everyone's competing with each other. The level of respect there is between garages is, is fantastic and there are days and nights where it's a great example of the teams pitching in and, and assisting. One of the things also that we don't put into perspective is if that Commodore is crashed like that in a normal road car situation, which it won't be because you don't often crash at 200 kilometres an hour. But the reality around that car, with that level of damage, it's at the panel shop for a month. How much do you like car racing? A lot. Put your hand up if you like watching cool laps. His yeah. hand's right up, folks. So yesterday we saw record-breaking speed really off the bat from the minute that Wind Cup went out. But in the third practice session, this lap of Scott McLaughlin's was outstanding. So the best thing to do here, crank up a telly, sit down and watch this and enjoy a 2 minute 3.7 at Mount Panorama, Scott McLaughlin.
So what do you reckon of that bloke driving that car on that lap? Uh, he's a bit average. No, he's, he's a vlog. <laughs> do you reckon he could have found some more time? Uh, yeah, for sure. I think everyone could have been a bit faster yesterday. Um, but yeah, for us to... Yeah, I think we're only on two tyres there, so the car was good. It was a little bit loose in areas, so we needed to tune it up, but um, yeah, a good start to the, the week. Yeah, you did have uh, two used ones on the left-hand side, and you had a pretty big moment coming around the right-hand and exiting the chase. Yeah. Do you think it, uh, you're pushing, thinking that you had the four greens on rather yeah. than forgetting you only had two? That's what I said at the end of the interview yesterday. Um, you know, I... I, I it's even out of the cutting, the right hander had a big slide there. And I'm, I, I reminded myself throughout the top of the hill, oh yeah, I've only got two, two greens. And then I got to the chase, I got all excited again. So um, you're just trying to find that grip and have a crack. But um, this session now for Alex is just all about trying to go out there and, and have another feel and get more laps. And, you know, he's done a great job as well. He, he did great yesterday, didn't he? Yeah, he did. And, you know, there's a lot of conjecture about him coming in and whatever. But he always comes in and does a great job. There's a long way to go. But, um, you know, really proud and trust the guy immensely. You can see you're confident. Thanks, mate. Yeah, thanks. Does an extraordinary job, Alex Premer. He's a creature, isn't he? I mean, he just arrives out of the blue, very little exposure to a supercar during the year, and he just bombs in and then picks up where he left off. He does a lot of driving instruction and a lot of other support category stuff in the US, but these are very different cars to any other category anywhere in the world. He slides in. I bumped into him last night with Ludo. And uh, are you happy? Yep. You comfortable? Yep. You feel like you can go faster? Yep. Okay. He's a human. You don't need to call him a creature. <laughs> <laughs> and he did a really nice job yesterday and the intensity of the battle between cars 17 and triple eight yesterday was pretty impressive if you missed the action it ended up being 0.15 of a second between mclaughlin and wind cup and it was interesting to study that lap it's the first chance that i really had to take a breath and watch it in detail that wild moment out of the cutting there were one or two moments across the top of the hill he chased that car the whole way and i had some customers ask yesterday do you think a two's on if you'd said to me early in the week is that a possibility? Oh, gee, I don't know. But, you know, maybe. If you get the conditions right, at the moment there's no wind out there. It's a cool track. There's a bit of cloud cover. The car's gripped up and they're bright, shiny the tyres. Those Dunlop tyres are really well matched to this racetrack. So maybe, if all things are equal, it's a possibility. But it's an interesting question to pose. But we'll slide back down into the pit lane now with Rihanna. Jake Kostecki just back into the garage. Gee, it's been a tough start to the weekend for you. Just tell us what happened out there. Yeah, so I think one of the guys accidentally left the rack stop in, but um, mistakes happen. I made a mistake yesterday myself, so we'll get it fixed up and be out there as soon as we can. All right, thanks for that. Thank you. Cheers. Well, so, uh, well if that is going to happen and things do go wrong with race cars, to your point a few moments ago, it's a human business. Uh, I'd much rather be dealing with that at whatever he was doing, 80 kilometres an hour at the end of Mountain Straight. How would he have felt that coming out of the lane and up the hill? Well, that was the thing that's weird. Yeah. You've got to get turned left out of the lane before you get up there. But... Oh, sorry. So he may have only left the one side in. Uh... So he, he may have... Yeah, and it, and it may have actually locked itself in there to the point where it didn't... Uh... It didn't come out when he, he turned it slightly left to come out of the lane. And so so when you wheel line the cars, what we do is we set steering and then we put rack stops in, so they're aluminium billeted rack stops to make, make sure that the steering is centred and then you do the wheel alignment and make sure that the camber toe and caster is all where you'd like it. It's, it's essentially for doing the toe in more than anything else from a wheel on perspective. So the rack stops are there for a reason and uh, and to not take them out that's the it, it looked something like that didn't it straight away so it just wouldn't turn right very unusual set of circumstances but thankfully uh, some obvious signs of gravel rash down the left hand side of the car when it's belted the tire barrier down there but hopefully not too much damage and they did to fight again with that one very unusual circumstances and if you're going to have it happen better to have it happen at that low speed than somewhere where the consequences are greater car number 97 was very quick yesterday as well ended up being in the yeah, top 10 eighth position in this lap. two minute 4.1 that was grant person on the radio in the background celebrating 50 years of holden factory support of cars battling here at the great race and the livery on the Red Bull Holden Racing Teams reflects that. You can see in the background Craig Lowndes, who said yesterday that it took just a couple of laps to be able to get himself back in the groove and remind himself about the flow that's required to get things right around here. Dean Cando's in car number 21, the cool drive car that yesterday brought 
Macaulay Jones unstuck on the run into the cutting up at turn four. Just arrived a little bit too quick. And then when he went back to second gear, it just locked the rears and threw him up into the wall there. Now, Tander's done the best time, two minutes, 7.2. Tony Delberto's done a two minutes, 7.6. And because of the breach that you were discussing a moment ago with those rack stops still in the car, that's a safety breach. The car's basically left the pit lane in an unsafe condition. So automatically, Cam's race control have to take a look at that. So it's popped up on the computer timing here is under investigation. Kind of 56, a safety breach. Their military style operations, these race teams, it's really impressive the way in which they're managed, organised, the structures, the spares, all of the support in the background. It's easy just to sort of go, oh yeah, there's the guys or the girls that just look after the cars, but there's protocols. Yep. And one of the things about the senior levels of motorsport is that any misstep in those checks and balances along the way can easily result in the sort of thing that happened. We've seen people with brake caliper bleed nipples open at the end of mountain straight and fire into the wall up there and those kinds of things very easy to misstep and that's actually one of the downsides of when you have damage here yeah so when crews have done all nighters and they're scrambling to get cars back in shape as they were with car number 56 people are tired they just can't operate 20 hours a day yeah it puts a real stress on everybody up and down the garage and uh, it only takes the tiniest little error for something to go wrong. Totally, and, and what you'll find is part of that procedure and protocol is that Clouds goes to the top now with a 6-3. What they do is they have a checklist. We used to put it under the wiper in the old days and it was a piece of paper and everybody basically puts their initial against whatever the checklist is and most of that is about safety. Today, actually, we'll get Murph or Larco just to show us what they use now, but it's effectively a big page on a computer screen and it's in front of the particular car and everybody has gone through the protocol of ticking those things off in a more formal way. And that's where it's hard when you're, when you're a wild card entry and you're not regularly a part of the processes of, of duking it out in the big end of town because it goes up another level, not just on the racetrack for speed, but in all of the other organisational and operational aspects of the race team. Yep. And they use that same system to track the changes through the course of the weekend. So when you've changed the front spring rate, for instance, the checklist gets updated. So you know at that point what spring the car has in it, what the corner weights were when it went in. A lot of times the, the teams even do those changes overnight so that they know exactly when you put that spring in, how much you need to wind the perches, etc., to make sure that the corner weights are right. So Craig Lowndes with a 6-3, Will Brown with a 6-4, Bryce Forward, great job, 6-5. They're going to be a pretty good combination, Forward and Heimgartner in this race. Heimgartner was fast yesterday. I spoke to Todd Kelly this morning to ask about the source of the pace for the Nissan, and he said, yeah, obviously, we've been messing around and trying to come up with the right trim in aero, but he feels that the major gain that's been made here is actually whenever there's high grip tracks, their car tends to go well. And he said, the track's incredible out there at the moment. Roland Dane made that comment to me yesterday. Could be a little bit wary of it because of that emulsion that you speak about yep. and how it impacts the grip levels because it can disappear as the weekend progresses and then you find yourself boxing in shadows. Uh, but high grip has helped them enormously. But he said the engine gains they've made are notable year on year when they look at their data from last year. Uh -huh. So they've made good ground in engine performance, the cars balance well for the grip conditions, and they have made a little gain out of, as you said, it's very, very small. They're battling to the feel at the moment, the chart is made to the aero. Will Brown and Anton Di Pasquale had a very competitive day yesterday with car number 99. Remember, it was a second row start for them in 2018. You've got to stop and reflect, Mark, that Anton and Will were rookies here last year, and they battled off the start beginning of the race and it looked like they'd been here for 20 years they're fast and into it they ultimately had a door flicking open at one stage which was a pest and then ended up with contact with the wall later in the day for what was a pretty difficult weekend for Erebus in 2018 but they're nice and speedy again this weekend and car number 99 finished up ninth in that fast third session yesterday there is Anton Di Pasquale with the team over Betty Clemenko she said she had a tear in the eye last night just watching all of that work unfold inside that garage. David Reynolds is watching on the right-hand side. And the interloper in the background there is Greg Murphy. And Lowndes just reported that he's happy yeah, with the front, job, still up. needs more work on the rear. So it's a little bit lively at the back. His comment is a good one because 
That time was a six dead, and Will Brown's just gone into the fives with a 5.99. One of the other things that we picked up on yesterday, we said how close it was for the lead drivers, the primary drivers, but there were 15 cars within 0.8 of a second in the co-driver session. So in terms of being close, 15 of the co-drivers were all within 0.8. So when you think about a lap of in excess of two minutes, arguably double the length of most of our racetracks, 0.8 of a second across 15 cars is extraordinary. So that bodes well for a tight race. When you talk about the stints, there's seven stops, eight stints for this race on Sunday. And that, from a co-driver perspective, is going to be on. Seventh fastest yesterday for car number 12 in the fast third session for Fabian Coulthard and for Tony Delberto. P1 broken, keep cruising. Nice work, P159 for Tony. So he drops back in here year on year and looks pretty quick. They were on the podium here in 2017. There were some people asking the question at the end of yesterday's running because they saw what was thought to be a loose seat belt in the car, but in fact, because of the different body sizes of the guys, they actually run two different lap belts. Uh -huh. But they were very quick yesterday, and that time had just been achieved there, 5.9 in these conditions on those tyres, from a co-driver perspective, is very, very good. So Fabian was really happy last night when we corresponded just about the basic behaviour of the car, off to a good start. Said he wasn't entirely happy, but as you know, when you, you just tweak the car a little bit here and you stitch all 23 of those corners together, a tiny whisker in every one yields a nice number on the dashboard when you do eventually get there. Um, just struggling a little bit with the rear of the car from the middle of the corner, that is the apex of the corner to the exit, just a little bit lively. And in fact, when you think about McLaughlin's lap that we witnessed just when we were in the red flag portion of this session, we had that look about it, didn't it? The cars are a little bit biased towards the nose at the moment. They're a bit pinned on the nose, which will be great for one lap speed, but I'm not sure that I'd want to do 161 laps that way. It'd be a pretty tired monkey at the end of all that. Swinging off those. What's bars. going on with your creatures today? Huh? It's Fast Friday. This is my favourite day in motorsport because if the weather's kind to us today, the sparks fly. This is the day you require. Remember, you're often in the garage next to us. Just keep feeding tyres and just keep sharpening the pencil and looking at those numbers and what you drag out of yourself on Friday at Bathurst is amazing. Yeah. And very often, don't do anything with the car. Glenn Seaton was the same. Just keep throwing tyres at it, maybe a couple of tiny little tweaks, and think deeply about where you've left anything on the table, find a millimetre here and there, and then there's a payback with the lap speed at the end of it. Totally. In that qualifying session we've got this afternoon, I'm 100% with you. It is the highlight of the year. I'm going to put Murph up there in one of those, aren't we? Through the day. That's Send him on a, on a tour. <laughs> yeah. That's where he'll be seated. He'll be able to do traffic reports for us. <laughs> the weather reports. <laughs> Love the smell of napalm in the morning. That'll be in the next session. That's the Greg Murphy seat. It's a throne. If we're in New Zealand, that's where the king would be. <laughs> Should put a title in there. They've even got a very expensive Bose headset for it. Their noise cancelling headset. That's impressive. <laughs> Tander now, fastest with a 5.44. Delberto with a 5.69. Will Brown, 5.99. Lowndes, 6 dead. Moffat, 6.2. Thomas Randall, good job, 6.4. Caruso, 6.5. Bryce Forward, 6.5. Prema, 6.6. Alex Davison, 6.8. Chris Pither has now jumped into 10th, and he has done a 6.7. So. When I was saying before about how close it was, as this session goes on, we're seeing really good pace. Tander looks like he's got that car well within his liking. Delberto's done another fastest first sector. So at the moment, Delberto is fastest in sector one, Lowndes in sector two, and Tander in sector three. This is the replay that we're looking at here at the moment, Mark, is Richard Musket. We saw the aftermath of this. He's just outbreaking himself. There were a couple of people. James Courtney did it yesterday, just running wide down there, and managed to just run along the fringe of that gravel trap, which many popped out the other side, and then they've taken that car back in now. Boost Mobile, Gary Rogers Motorsport entry. Car number 34 yesterday actually ended up at midfield, so in 15th position for James Golden, and he achieved a 4-7. Those numbers just 
make the eyebrows go up, don't they? So it's just incredibly fast. <laughs> it's actually hard to verbalise. You know, four. Wow. And you, if you'd said not so long ago that you'd be able to punch out uh, mid four, but be 15, you go, well, that doesn't equate. Totally. Hey guys, sorry, um, just down here in the Hino Hub now, you heard the boys talking about the rack stops that caused that incident up there at turn two with the Kostiki wild card. Now, hard to understand how the rack stops and a car could just drive straight into a wall like that. Let me show you on our V8 supercar CAD drawing. Now, if I turn my car upside down, let's drill in and we'll find the power steering rack. Okay. There it is underneath the car right there. Now, if I grab my texter, you imagine there's a couple of steering arms coming off that, out to each side to obviously steer the car. They move the uprights. Now, what we do when we wheel align a car, we put rack stops just in here. I'll grab a different colour. Just in there on the end of the rack, we put another one. They're aluminium. Just in there on the end of the rack, they're kind of a C-shape. They clip on there and there, so the steering wheel can't move. And importantly, if I come back in here, it means that the two wheels are pointing absolutely true dead ahead, so you can then wheel align the car and work on the car from that point. So if you depart the car, send out a pit lane with those rack stops in there, she's locked in dead ahead. Well done, Larka. It's very good. That's exactly the issue. And a bit of a mystery for me how it got that far up the hill before working it out. Yeah, it should have been one of the one of the things you do when you leave the pit, and that's a little bit of an experience, is that you always never leave the pit area with the brake pedal not fully up. <laughs> so you, you've got your left foot on the pedal and making sure the pedal's up. And the second thing is, as soon as you get out of pit lane, is that you swerve the car left and right and make sure that the steering is working properly. So just from a experience standpoint I'll I'll bet that uh, those boys have noted that and that's uh, something that from an experience perspective they'll learn looking into inter-team battles and comparing both primary and co-drivers mark and the various teams then looking back to practice two yesterday which was exclusively for the co-drivers uh, the fastest driver in that session on a 5-6 was James Moffat so looking here at Garth Panda 5-4 so very tight for peak speed. Dalberto the same. And Dalberto the same. OK, I wasn't sure where your point yeah. was going to go there. And uh, yesterday's uh, second fastest car was Premier on a 5.6. At the moment, Alex is in the car down in ninth and he's on a 6.4. The third fastest car in practice two, the co-driver session yesterday, was Tony Dalberto. And you just pointed out that he's done a 5.4. So just understanding where they're at. Uh, this session's not really necessarily about fireworks. It's more about just go and get some miles up, feel what the car's like on a heavy fuel load, understand what happens through the journey, just get yourself comfortable. Uh, increasingly, as this day progresses, it becomes more about the primary driver looking for warp speed later in the day. So this will be one of the last opportunities the co-drivers get to be able to go, I need to seat up a mill, I need the pedal shifted here, can you, what about, what does that button do? Yep. All of that stuff. And that's, right now, a very important exit for Luke Yildon, who's done roughly half a lap in car nine as a check, and they'll probably bring his car in. What normally happens as part of the protocol, if you've had a damaged car, whoa, big slide there. Jonathan Webb with the right-hand rear guard right against the fence coming out of the cutting. That was very close. I don't know, did he give it a bump? Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did, yeah announcement earlier in the week that uh, on Wednesday as Bryce Fullwood just jumps up now in the fifth position that uh, Techno will be moving operations to Sydney Motorsport Park for Team Sydney for 2020. Yeah, so it was only a light rub, but it was enough for Jono to be able to roll out of the trouble coming out of the cutting, think twice about it after that. So uh, this is the back on the horse moment here for Luke Yulden. This car tortured at the end of practice yesterday, Hi. back on the flatbed truck worked through until 5 and 6 o'clock this morning. They fired it up at 5 a.m. An extraordinary effort by the team. And, uh, you yeah, know, the thing about this is that Luke's gone out and done a million laps of this place before. He's just got to fall back into that groove. I'm surprised by not driving it back into the pit and checking it. Just an install lap. Yeah, I'm really surprised by that. I mean, you've had a car completely apart and I would have driven it back in and 
popped it up in the air and plucked the wheels off it and just made sure everything was all right. So that's obviously Luke must have reported in. I didn't actually hear him over the radio. We've got, Neil and I have got all the drivers on our system that we can hear them talking back to the pit. I didn't hear him say, I oh, know the car feels great. He probably doesn't need to be on the slide like that either. Right here is where it all came unglued yesterday. It bottomed out in the front, understeered off that corner and then made heavy contact with the wall. You can still see the witness marks in the background. So he's done a 52-0 in sector one, which is only eight tenths away from the fastest of the session so far for Delberto. So he's pressing on hard. Mark's grimacing a bit here at the moment because you were voting in favour of an installation lap followed by a careful inspection. Oh, he's got it. He actually had the rears locked on the run into Forest Elbow there. So this is certainly back on the horse for him. So car number seven's been impressive so far this weekend. Bryce Bullwood's the leader of the Dunlop Super 2 Series. And he's had, I think, five victories so far this year. He's been very strong. So his confidence will be high at the moment. And he's got a nice handy points margin in the support series for supercars and he's sitting fifth at the moment and he's on a two minute six flat near enough. That's really impressive. Mark? Um, Skate, could you go to your point and I think it's a good one. I just asked Barry Ryan, the team manager down there at Penrite Racing about why no installation lap. We sort of think that's what you probably do. I agree with that. He said we're professionals. It's on warm-up tyres. A uh, lot of faith in his team. So uh, uh, I love his faith. Uh, also another quick tidy up. You saw me do that little cat diagram there with the uh, the rack stops regarding the Kostecki car. Of course, I was showing you both of them. That could have only made it out of the pit lane if only one of them was put in there. Thanks yeah. for the update, Mark. So uh, Barry's got faith. Uh, Luke Yorden ended up doing a 7-8 at the end of it. And this is what happened yesterday. Um, so it was the, the latter part of what we call the metal grade area of the racetrack, which is up in the Sulman Park Reed Park area. And that was the reaction, the replay from yesterday's incident. And then they took Luke off to the medical centre because it triggered the medical light in the car because it was more than 20 Gs, the impact in the concrete wall. And uh, then they worked literally all through the night on this car and replaced an enormous amount of equipment. And this is what it's like back on board here. This is exactly right there, the spot, and then straight ahead into the sign event wall on the right. He'll be sore. And that's a couple of hundred kilometres an hour down in there. And uh, ended up doing a 2 minute 7.8. So he didn't stay fully committed to the lap at the end of it. But uh, Luke Yulden just getting some valuable miles again. So 34 odd minutes remaining in this session. Garth Tander's the fastest on a 5-4. Oh, he's got it locked up at Forest Elbow. And then Tony Delberto, Craig Lowndes is back in the lane from Will Brown, Bryce Fullwood, Dale Wood, James Moffat, Alex Premer, Dean Fiore, Thomas Randall, that's your 10. Michael Caruso just outside from Alex Rulo, Chris Pitler, Warren Luff. Alex Davison, Ash Walsh, Perkins, Blanchard, Musket, Richards, Canto, who we saw on screen before, Jonathan Webb, who just rubbed the wall on the exit of the cutting, Jack Smith, James Hinchcliffe out there as well. Just making the point also, there are some questions of, about the way in which they've allocated the drivers in car number 27 this weekend at Walkinshaw and Driddy United for the wildcard entry for the Napa Auto Parts Racing Australia entry. And uh, James is the co-driver, therefore Alex is the primary driver that's been nominated in that car. So a little super slow-mo replay of some action at the dipper here. Just a little wisp of blue smoke as he locks up on the run there as it unweights the left-hand side of the car. So he's moved up into 22nd position now on a 7-4. I think I heard Mark Larkham say before it was on pretty scruffy tyres. There is car number 27. So this is James, uh, James Hinchcliffe, Canadian IndyCar driver who's had tremendous success in North America. He has driven a supercar previously on the Gold Coast when the Internationals formally visited back in yesteryear. And uh, these guys having their first experience at Mount Panorama into the final corner for him. Where's 27 at the moment? Down in 25th place on a 2 minute 7.7. .7. Indy Lights runner up in 2010, then made the jump into IndyCar with Newman Haas and was Rookie of the Year in 2011. And hole at the Indy 500, the 100th running of that event in 2016. So he's had six wins, 25 top fives, 49 top tens in his IndyCar career. He had a terrible shunt at Indy, which people do in 2015. 
and uh, that knocked him around. He came back and got the pole a year after, and this is a bit of a Tander. moment for Tander, oh. who almost gets James Moffat in the process. That was close to going in the fence then. Yeah, found the gravel on the exit of turn one. So James Hinchcliffe, the bottom line to all of this, is vastly experienced at international level of competition. And so back riding now with Garth Tander down the bottom of the hill. There'll be a bit of garbage on those tyres, so it wouldn't have been a fully committed lap over the top after that, as we reach back up over the top of the hill with the chopper. And if you worked with us yesterday, James Hinchcliffe was saying that he found the bottom end of the track reasonably easy. The top of the circuit in terms of going across those fast corners were a little problematic, but down the hill was the biggest issue, and that's often the case. And it's interesting, isn't it, boys? We've seen this before. Remember Neil, Mark, we're all there. Remember Scott Pruitt, who was a world-class IndyCar driver, came back out here. Gee, when was it, guys? Maybe 90... Mid-90s. Mid-90s, like yeah. And, uh, and, and he struggled because the tough thing for these guys, for all their talent, and they've got plenty, is these cars are so vastly different. Forget the track, that's the hard bit. But then add the car. High centre of gravity, low aerodynamic downforce compared to what they're used to, low grip tyre compared to what they're used to, and this weird, weird kind of taxi cab thing that we talk about where the car just moves around a lot. Now, take that up the hill at 200 k's an hour um, and then sit them on the wrong side of the car. Gee, they're up against it, aren't they? <laughs> he's one of your mates, Larko James Hinch. If he's into guitars, you need to go and talk to him. Only if he's into Keith Urban alongside him, mate. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be able to give him some... Uh, Cultural exchange, I'm sure, oh. I'll spend some quality time with him. No, but it's, it is a good point. They're very different cars to the sorts of cars that these guys spend their lives in. Alex has done a bit of sports car racing as well, ironically, with, with Penske. And I think uh, in the background, Penske tried pretty hard to lure him away from Andretti's, uh, but they've secured him at Andretti Autosport ongoing, uh, which was also very important to the Honda campaign in North America, so he'll be staying put with Michael, who's here this weekend. I think uh, Roger Penske and his wife Kathy will be joining us this weekend as well. So there are a lot of people coming from all around the globe to witness this event. We're back with Jonathan Webb now, car number 19, in 19th position, and he's done a 6-9. Former winner of this race. And uh, just listening on the radio in the background, I think they're talking about making a roll centre change with... Uh, Car 21. Yeah, I, was, I couldn't pick who it was. I was just listening to the same thing. There are lots of little tweaks. It's Greg Murphy took to very right. That's a big off. Got it stopped. That was a nasty lockup. And that's Chris Pither. It's a spot that you don't often concentrate on the bumps there, but there's large. Undulations. I think I've heard the tyre. Um, I've got a read on that, so happy to pit this lap. So he's got a read on it, happy to pit this lap. It's been really successful here in the last several years, Chris Pither. So he was fourth in 2017 with Dale Wood and uh, sixth last year with Garth Tander. And you just heard that he's got a read on the car, but he's also got a flat spot on the tyre. He's hurt the tyre and you can see the replay there as he turned it in and it unweighted the inside front tyre. That's uh, locked up pretty hard. Boost mobile car number 33 on screen, so he'll be sharing with another fast Kiwi in Stanaway. He had a really nasty shunt at the top of the hill back in 2008. Remember that poor wheel incident that Chris Piffin was involved in? That was a nasty one. Uh, car number three on screen, another of the Nissans this weekend. And Deep Fiore, who's got a lot of experience at Mount Panorama, is sharing with Gary Jacobson his 11th start. Year six with Kelly Racing, so yeah, he's slid that car into ninth position and slid it out of turn one as well. After the, that big repair, sorry Neil, after that big repair, we just heard back from Most Control that they asked car nine to put another tail light in the right rear. So after you work all night, get it all sorted. <laughs> Starlight not working. <laughs> we had a shot of it up there before. I wasn't sure what they were working on, but that, that's what it was. So if that's their biggest problem today, that, that, that'll be OK. So what I was about to say there, Mark, is that Dean ended up sixth in 2017. So you know, he's a solid performer around here as well. 11th start for him this weekend. A couple of top tens. And continuity is an important thing 
So he stayed with the same team, but it's a new pairing combination, Gary Jacobson and Dean Fiore. And I, I covered this off yesterday, but uh, 26 entries in total, 52 drivers this weekend, and 11 of those combinations have remained the same year on year, but uh, 15 of them have changed. And that's a very big percentage. You don't often see that. The teams like to try and find a settled comfort with the driver-co-driver pairings as they build a rapport and understand what each other want. But this year there's been a lot of churn in that regard, which is another little thing, actually, just thinking in the background that has to be managed. So the two of them getting to know what each prefers and living with each other's nuances because you can't just pull the blanket to your side of the bed necessarily. You've got to actually go, OK, look, I can see that we need the seat in this position or the belt's done like this, etc., etc. So there's a little bit of that. You never, well, never's probably too strong a word, but you're rarely 100% comfortable as you would have your own car. Totally. It's, it, there's usually some form of compromise that you go, oh, I'll live with it. And depending on your demeanour, some live with it more than others. Mm. Well, you're looking at me so harshly. I'm just or... looking at someone who I reckon had a fair bit of the blanket on his side of the bed, but I might be maligning you. Now, this weekend is pretty special because it celebrates 40 years, Mark, since we first had these things installed in cars. Now, for sport and for motorsport, cameras everywhere. It's just how it is now. It's the way things are. But it wasn't always that way, and it was back in 1979 that everything changed. At the time, it was exciting, an exciting thing to be involved in. Um, uh, but when, when the realisation came, when, when it all happened, uh, uh, the, the actual um, uh, reception of the public, and, and it's just amazing. Like, I become a hero in one night. And I... Those times, people still to this day say to me, gee, I wish we could go back there where we, we actually had guys talking in cars and and with the race cam and things like that, it was, it was, well, it was groundbreaking worldwide. One of the problems, of course, was weight and size of things. They ended up trying to, they used a, a miniature camera called a HCSF Thompson, which was designed for the Moscow Games. But gee, miniature, it was huge. When we first addressed race cam with Dick Johnson, we got a bonus. He was the most relaxed race cam driver we ever had. Uh, we had some drivers who never worked out on race cam, but Dick, with his one-liners, was sensational, and it didn't seem to affect his driving. Not many people, I don't think, can do it or could do it to be able to still maintain a, a reasonable lap time and, and talk in the car, but um, for some reason, you know, maybe only half my brain was working. Television coverage of motorsport before race cam was dull and boring, and without race cam, it's dull and boring. In one of the early runs where we had George using race cam at Bathurst, he unfortunately, from his great demeanour, which impressed all of us, he launched into this tirade of abuse and four-letter words. George carried race cam after that, but he didn't do any talkies. Yes, yeah, so it's great to catch up uh, with some of the legends of our game and discuss the way things were once upon a time with the arrival of uh, onboard cameras in the cars. It really changed everything, and every single car's got them now, multiples of angles. So we're all over it. We're over their shoulders, we're under their feet, we're listening to the drivers, and uh, now they're tiny. They were, it's, it, it's grams, not kilos. They were massive things before, they sat up really high. I mean, these days people get into a cold sweat and the screaming nuclear war over a kilo of centre of gravity. These things were 17 kilos back in the day. Yeah, unbelievable. Great to catch up with so many of those men and women who worked so hard on getting that technology across the line and the development through the ages. I'll always remember my best one was Dick Johnson leading when we had a secondary race here in 1995. He led the race and he was talking on race cam and he actually lost the rear wing in the chase. He was going off the road and Mike Raymond was talking to him. <laughs> yeah, it's a famous bit of vision, that one. And, uh... <laughs> Of course, everybody at the time thought that it had something to do with talking to him, and uh, it wasn't. It was actually a failure with the car. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was great. The late Peter Williamson was the first driver ever to carry a camera, and he talked, and he talked, and he talked all day long. He's a great character and a great guy, and we sadly lost him not so long ago. Now, there was a whole bunch of kangaroos there. Is that a bunch or We've had a this flock chat. or a mob? What, what We've is that? We've had this chat. We know this. Uh, you know, it's like your area of specialty. 
no one else in the world's got a clue. <laughs> what do you do at night? Garth Tander is our fastest driver out there at the moment. Two minute 5.4 from Delberto. It's four one thousandths of a second as Mark contemplates the answer. And Will <laughs> Brown is third fastest. You want to have a crack? It's a mob. There it is. Or it's reliably informed. It's a smack of jellyfish. <laughs> oh, it's going to stop all conversations, isn't it? It's a coalition of cheaters. Of which you were one. <laughs> so, Will Brown, <laughs> third place at the moment, four tenths of a second off the money. So, a colourful group of characters that we heard from before about the onboard cameras and the colourful shirt for Gary Wilkinson, I noted there as well. Car number nine's gone back out with a new tail light. So, Luke's actually shuffled up into 14th position now and he's showing personal best in sectors one and two. Last lap, there's a two minute 6.6, .6, so he's getting well back into the groove at the moment. He's only 1.2 seconds away from the fastest time we've seen so far. This is practice four, exclusively for co-drivers, by the way. It's a 60 minute session with 21 and a half minutes remaining. And as the day progresses, and so far so good with the weather, the emphasis is going to shift more towards speed. And we've got a problem here up at the top of the hill. So this is Thomas Randall. Has he got a lot of damage here? He's 11th fastest at the moment at 2 minutes 6.3. And uh, Michael Caruso also got a drama here. So hey, things damage, going uh, wrong suddenly for uh, Tickford. Damage just won't start. So is he rolling it down uh, the hill? Yeah, that's okay. Just be patient. Be patient with it. Get started and get back for it. So he's made contact with the outside wall at Forest Elbow, Thomas Randall. Meantime, at the bottom of the hill, the sister car is playing up as well. And Michael Caruso is the one with this car. And this is the Cam Waters car that yesterday was pretty quick. I reckon they're testing fuel empty or not. So you're running the cars right to the last bit. And that looks suspiciously like two cars running out of fuel. Uh, one one well, car. Yeah, this one. one yeah, car. I'm not sure about this yeah. one. This might be running out of road. <laughs> Yeah, that's right out of road. You're right. <laughs> so, a lock break understeer moment for Thomas Randall at the top of the hill. And um, Mark just having a bit of a guess. Actually, he's gone in pretty firmly there. So, that'll give that right front a fair tweak. Early days. He's a debutant in the main game this weekend. Thomas Randall, after running as a wild card at Tail and Bend earlier in the year at the Bend Motorsport Park. Mark Larkin, what's the update? Ah, uh, you boys are right on the money. I just asked Tim Edwards, any chance you're running that car very low on fuel? He looked at me, gave me a wink, and said, "Might be." <laughs> so, uh, as you know, they've lived this dream before, winning the race in 2014. As a result of Jamie Winkup's low fuel, so learning how to run these things very, very, very low, part of the action. Uh, I can't take any credit for it. It's, uh Old mate, the kangaroo mob lover that was all over that one. So it was a good guess. But he overreached a bit on the Thomas Randall one because I don't reckon you could blame fuel for that. No, you could, you'd go with that one. You were right on that one. Luke Gildon, how about that? Up to sixth with a 599 and, and with a better first sector. So this might actually put him up a little bit further. So that's a good confidence boost. Lee Holdsworth there in the door with Thomas. And he'd be just giving him a little bit of advice. And that's just a question of exploiting limits up there. I mean, the, the, those tyres will have seen better days. If you stay with the big brake pressure on the run into Forest Elbow, locking that inside front is very easily done. And there's always, not about you, but there's always been that feeling when you get to Forest Elbow that you don't want to collect. There's a little pinch in the yeah, wall yeah, right yeah. there. And you always had the feeling you could whack it. I don't think, I mean, I never hit it, but it's no. actually the outside where all the trauma happens. But there's something in the back of your mind that makes you fearful of the wall on the inside. And uh, the road disappears dramatically. If you walk on that particular part of the racetrack, it disappears from underneath you very quickly. So locking and running wide um, is something that happens. And he'll, he'll put that in the bank now and probably won't happen again, Greg. Yeah, and he was actually uh, pushing on. Lee Holford just told me that uh, he was looking like he was on his best lap in the session so far. Just pinched that inside. We saw the lock lights come on. Fortunately, it doesn't look like there's been too much damage done, Lee. Yeah, he probably did the right thing there by just sort of straightening it up and going into, into the tie barriers. Um, 
So yeah, hasn't done too much damage. Uh, yeah, obviously, you know, he's still just building speed and building confidence. Um, yeah, he was on for a good lap. We'll put him on some good tyres now and he can have a bit of fun. Yeah, I noticed there was another set laid out. Was that planned anyway or was that uh, just now put on because of uh, what happened? Yeah, we were going to bring him in that lap, but he was on his best one, so we we're going to let him finish and then bring him in for another set. But, um, yeah, I, I think fortunately it looks like the, the steering's still straight. Um, there's no real, you know, structural damage, so hopefully he'll send it out and uh, go quicker. Thanks, Bob. Thanks. Yesterday, Lee Holdsworth finished uh, sixth fastest with a two-minute 4.0. It was an incredibly high-speed run. Here's the replay of what happened to his teammate Thomas Randall and Forrest Selvo up at the top of the hill. And uh, once they get him back out on some new tyres, and now he'll crush away all those concerns about grip and just overstepping the mark a little bit at that particular spot. Uh, we reported before that yesterday there were 15 cars within 0.8 of a second. Today there's 12 cars. In fact, Thomas Randall is the 12th car there within 0.8 of Garth Tander. James Moffat was the fastest of the co-drivers yesterday. Bryce Forward has now done the fastest first sector in car seven. So again, we keep on talking about the prospects of Heimgartner and Forward. And through the course of practice yesterday, Rick Kelly and Dale Wood were quite strong also. So they're currently eighth. So we were riding and looking over the shoulder of James Moffat then on the run up to turn four at the cutting and that was on the limiter in fourth gear there. So that was a good solid run out of turn two to achieve that. Keep an eye on Bryce Fullwood as we're watching James over the top of the hill. Bryce is currently sitting in fifth position in the Nissan and as you noted, he's done the best sector that we've seen in sector one. He's done a personal best in sector two. The fastest in that sector, which is fundamentally over the top of the hill, is Craig Lowndes. He's on a 33.4 and Bryce Fullwood's just done a 33.46. So mm. he's right with him. So if he keeps these numbers alive at the moment, Bryce Fullwood could go at or near the top. Here he is, car seven. Looks Andre good. Heimgartner is the primary driver of the Plus Fitness Nissan. And there's certainly been an uplift in performance here on year for all of the Nissans we saw one stage yesterday. Simona was fifth fastest in her session. Got into a very smart time very quickly. So how good is this number? Good Gary. enough to be at the top. Two minute 5.4. Two one thousandths of a second over Garth Tander. Any time that you're in front of somebody with the sort of experience and success that Tander's had here, you're doing pretty well. How's that? So three tenths of three uh, of the manufacturers, Nissan, Holden, Ford with the Mustang, are separated by 0 0.0077. Crazy. That is out of control. It is good scape, isn't it? Now, listen, you can hear Caruso just leaving the uh, pit lane here, fired up again. Now, uh, Tim Edwards, uh, team principal, he was being a little bit cheeky with me. He just conceded. I said, hang on, mate. He said it ran out of fuel. He said, well, I never confirmed it. They were playing with very low fuel. They actually went to the front of the car. There was an electrical problem with that car. They won't tell me exactly what it is, but it's rectified and it's just gone. So watch this space. Yeah, it's not good when you have little electrical gremlins. They're hard to fix those sometimes. So I thought the little drop out of fuel was an easy fix. This is Ash Walsh who locks a wheel then puts the right hand front into the dirt on the right hand side. Spins it around reasonably nicely. Freightliner racing entry sitting in 16th at the moment for Ash and he went off at the final corner yesterday and found the gravel down there. So looking towards the east, back of the Blue Mountains there, you can see there's a little bit of weather, but as I spin around the commentary box and look west, it actually doesn't look too bad at the moment. There's the possibility in this district of light showers during the day, and some possibility, 30% in fact, of there being thunderstorms later in the day. That would spice things up. This is Alex Davison, car number 23, Milwaukee Racing, driving with his brother again, and a very quick run for this car yesterday. And several times we saw it lighting up purple. Back to Thomas Randall on those better tyres out there. So, car number 23 ended up being the fourth fastest car in the hands of Will Davis and got into the threes. There were four drivers that reached the threes yesterday. We celebrated the lap done by McLaughlin, but Windcup, Waters and Davison were really a snap of a finger behind, so there was really nothing in that. Thomas Randall, what's he look like at the moment? Fastest first sector, personal best for him over the top of the hill, so it's cleared the demons of Forrest's elbow. We'll see what he can produce down the bottom of the chase here. He's one of the six rookies in the field this weekend, but he's got Dunlop Super 2 experience at this racetrack. 
What's it like on the direction change? Pretty nice in the shift from second to third. It's telling. Making little cockpit adjustments on the run into the final corner. It just chirped the rear brakes, locked them up a little bit on the run in there, but this is going to vault him up the order for sure. Position number four, up eight spots, a two minute 5.5. Great job. confidence booster that one. Good job. Forwards are on a 5-4. Tander's on a 5-4. Dalberto's on a 5-4. They achieved those numbers very early. And Randall's just done a 5-5 on either a new or a better set of tyres. And then Will Brown's done a 5-8. Craig Lowndes has done a 5-9. Luke Yulden back after yesterday's damage. An outstanding job to be in the top 10. He's done a 5-9. James Moffat on a 6-1. Dale Wood on a 6-1. Have a run up into the cutting here with Thomas Randall. So we've talked a lot about the mid sector, the second sector of the racetrack. This is it, out of the cutting. Let's have a look and a listen. That's a great job on the, his next lap. He's just gone to the top, Thomas Randall, on a two minute 5.3. So that is a very impressive performance to be able to stitch together another lap and go faster on the second run. So Michael Caruso's up in fifth spot now. He's actually got the fastest time over the top of the hill, car number six, which we saw just limp back into the pit lane a few moments ago. And 5.4 for him. It's tight up there at the moment. Look at the co-driver run here. It's 5 3 5 That's the first six cars. So they're only separated back to Alex Prema by 0.4 of a second. But if you, re if you retract Go to there. Alex Prema out of it and you look at the top five, it's eight one-hundredths of a second between Randall and Caruso. That's nothing. Exactly. So that really bodes well. We saw... 15 cars within 0.8 of a second yesterday. And there's a lot of combinations that are going to be in contention on Sunday. This is one of them. Rick Kelly's good around here. Dale Wood's been doing lots of driving in the Porsche Carrera Cup. Thomas Randall's obviously got pace from the Super 2 Series. Bryce Forward is current leader of the Super 2 Development Series. He's currently second. We don't have to talk about Tander and Lowndes in terms of their experience. Prema was fast, we know he's good. Michael Caruso, strong. Will Brown and Anton Di Pasquale are a very strong combination. Luke Gilden's back with his confidence up. I don't know where you stop and start with that. There's, there's at least 12 combinations that can win this race. Isn't that fantastic, Scafie, when you see Luke back on the horse like that? But you know what's exciting about this for Sunday's race? This lack of disparity between co-drivers. Similarity in pace means that you're really going to push the race into the back end of the day because cars are going to be handed back consistently during the day with inside of each other. And I reckon this bodes for a great, great race. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Larko. That's, that's the point I was making about the number of combinations. I didn't really get into some of the others that are going to be strong, like Steve Richards with Mark Winterbottom, the Davison brothers, Warren Luff and Scott Pye, who've been second in the last couple of years. I mean, when you start to look at the field, there's a lot of combinations that are going to figure in this result. Alex Rulo in car number 78, Team Harvey Norman entry sharing with Simone Di Silvestro. Simone has picked up a Porsche factory driver's uh, Formula E 
test and development driver in 2020. So car number 78 at the moment sitting in the midfield. Uh, 16th position, 6'6", six, six, but now improved 10 spots and got into the mid fives as well. That's a big party of people. So that's a nice job. Second fastest of the Nissans, position six for Alex Rulo. Remember, incredibly young and uh, still not a huge amount of experience here. So when he saw that number pop up on the dash, it's only his third Bathurst 1000 event. He's pretty happy with the 5.5. Five. And Will Brown's just done a four. So Will Brown's just got into the fours, a two minute 4.9 for car number 99. He's put just over 0.3 of a second on Thomas Randall, who's now back in the pit lane. That is a fantastic job. Well done. Beautiful mid-sector. Anytime that you're faster than Tandra or Lowndes across the top of the hill, you're going very well. So he's done a 33-1-4 to be the fastest across the top of the hill. That's a and great job. And the fastest ever over the top of the hill. So 33-1-4-7-1 is the number just then for Will Brown. The fastest ever was McLaughlin in a shootout. He did a 32-8-2. Wow. So that's, that puts in perspective how strong Will Brown was over the top of the hill. And that's his teammate, Anton Di Pasquale. Rookie entry here last year. And some bleary eyes inside the Erebus garage after last night's hard work. Give you Tanda's second split in a second, because the first split was just slightly slower than Thomas Randall. The second split is a 33-3. That's two tenths slower than Will Brown. So Tanda having a real go. Now, one of the strengths for Tanda is his braking performance. He's always been very good in this bottom section of the racetrack. So just watch what Tanda does here. He stops the car really nicely. And he said to me yesterday that the thing that they were trying to work on was a bit unstable on entry into some of the slow stuff. So we're about to arrive at some of that. And the bottom corner. Mid corner speed, he's about 95 k's. Looks pretty tidy. He's a little bit lively on the exit but he's gone up a couple of spots into position two on a 5-1 on that lap he would have done thousands and thousands of laps here over the years Garth Tander so one of the things that would make him extremely valuable in that garage is knowing what you want from it from a point of view of a one lap car and a race car that's settled over the journey so a three-time winner in 2000 in the mixed conditions in that year 2009 2011 and a couple of pole positions five podiums so a pretty extraordinary run of success for garth tander i love that show. it's awesome isn't it isn't just we see it every year we just get some beautiful images from the chopper year on year and then we see fantastic shots of it doing its thing and uh, we've got 260 or more people here in the TV crew with 160 cameras covering everything around this mountain this weekend for you to enjoy the coverage of the biggest race of the year and I hope you're enjoying it and we're in our fourth practice session so far it's been a record breaking weekend and there's been a lot to talk about we've got a 598 point margin in the championship which the championship tends to get drifted off in the background a little bit when Bathurst arrives on the scene. But Scott McLaughlin's in a very powerful position coming into the race this year. But with the Pertec Enduro Cup only just starting now, it's high risk reward for these next three events, for here, the Gold Coast, and for Sandown. It's a 300-point weekend this weekend, which means you either make great profit or you suffer significant losses. And so what looks like comfortable cushions can evaporate or grow very quickly on this weekend. Totally. And just with that chopper shot, we're going to send Rick Murphy up in the next session to do the traffic report. <laughs> if he's good at it, we might send him right back to Sydney. Yes, a weather report back in Sydney. It's going to be raining there, apparently. I think it'd be good when he's up there when the thunderstorms happen later on today. I can see they're banked up a bit at Kelso. <laughs> Ariana. I'll just, I'll just quickly interrupt your uh, the comedy show at the moment. Uh, Chris Pith is in the garage at the moment. He's sharing that car with Richie Stanaway. They've got a misfire in that car, so just trying to do some diagnostics in the last part of this session. Thanks for the update. So watching car number 17 here, Alex Primer sitting comfortably inside the top 10. He's eighth at the moment. He's done a two minute 5.6. Price forwards just come into the lane. Interestingly, on this lap, Will Brown is showing his cumulative to the second sector mark, which might actually knock off his own best time. 
Yeah, he just missed. No, he's just missed. Just it. missed yeah. it by nothing. Yeah, a 504 plays a 498. Yeah, so at the end of the second sector where the tyres would still be performing, he was on target to actually go quicker than the 49, but he just did a two minute 5.04. So how's the consistency across those laps? Bust out your calculator, Mark, because that's point a oh six. pretty small number. Mm. So six hundredths of a second slower. Now, because you started me on the mob of kangaroos and there's been so many texts and emails and things coming in on Twitter and everything else, it's a colony of beavers. They don't have them here. <laughs> now, uh, Prema wandering into the lane from eighth position as we go back to Thomas Randall, who's drifted now to third, but it's only one third of a second. Actually, Tony Delberto's just punted him out of third spot. So Tony's just done a 5-2. So we're seeing a consistent pattern here of the Erebus cars being strong. No doubt that the Red Bull Holden Racing Team cars are strong. Shell V Power Racing Team cars strong. But I'll tell you who else is in the party so far this weekend is Nissan. Nissan, absolutely. We haven't seen quite as much fire from the Brad Jones Racing entries, nor the Walkinshaw Andretti United entries. In fact, Jack Perkins is in car 22 at the moment and down in 22nd position. Um, so the early trend is we're seeing those four groups constantly floating to the top, aren't we? Yep. And in fact, well, you've got to throw Tickford in there as well, but the, there's varied colours in those. So, for example, you know, you've got Michael Caruso and Cam Waters in there as well. So McLaughlin getting a quick debrief from Alex as to what the behaviour of that car's like. You, we talked earlier, Mark, about the pedigree of Alex Prema. You know, it's really impressive. He could potentially have gone on to be, you know, one of the biggest names internationally in the sport, but it's a tough game and sometimes you find yourself in the wrong place at the right time. It doesn't always necessarily work out. Nico Rosberg was his teammate in GP2. Lewis Hamilton was his teammate in GP2. You know, this is a guy that won at the highest level of the sport in sports cars in GP2, which is one step from Formula One. He had a little taste of a Formula One car and uh, it took a long time for him to come to terms with the task in supercars. He actually got replaced at Sydney Olympic Park by Scott McLaughlin at Gary Rogers Motorsport, ironically. They've been together. It's an interesting combo. Those drivers at the end of the pit lane watching the action, Reynolds and Winkup. Having a bit of a chat and uh, watching on the wall and listening on the radio. Uh, but he's ended up partnered with Scott McLaughlin uh, in the Enduros. He's done it on more than one occasion through a couple of teams. And they've got a real happy harmony. They, they communicate really well together. They obviously like the same thing from the car setup standpoint. So they'll be a formidable combination. But, you know, just looking back at some of the things he's done, Masters Formula 3 winner, Le Mans Series champion, the winners of the Pertec Enduro Cup back in 2016 as well. Thomas Randall just coming back into the pit lane. Uh, pit lane. Super Service backing that team. That announcement made just in the past week as well. Now, he went straight ahead here. I can tell by the what's showing on the timing. So he's had a little lock-up and aborted and gone straight down the escape road off the top of Skyline, Thomas Randall, and they've brought him in off the back of that. That little extra metre and a bit of apron on the run into the chase at the bottom of Conrod really helps the cause and allows you just to open up the corner a little bit there. You need every millimetre to be able to get the cars through there flat. The fastest corner in Australia, and one of the fastest in the world of motorsport. Caruso finishing up his lap here from position number five. The checkered flag's out for him. He threw a bit of rock around there at the end of it, moved up three spots. So he's only missed out on being the fastest by three one hundredths of a second from Will Brown. So an excellent start to proceedings also for Michael Caruso, who's shaking off a man cold. And 16 cars within a second. So Jonathan Webb is 16th and he's 0.96 away. A little cuddle there from Betty. Will has done an excellent job. Any time that you can do a four around this place, wow, that is a good lap time. Very impressive numbers out there by many of the co-drivers. Let's confirm the results. Practice four, a one-hour session. Will Brown the fastest from Michael Caruso, Garth Tander, Tony Delberto. Thomas Randall, Bryce Fullwood, Alex Rulo, an outstanding performance. Look at the three Nissan bunch together. Dean Fiore in there as well. Alex Premer, ninth. Ash Walsh got into the 10. Blanchard, Yulden, Wood, Lowndes, Moffat, Webb, Davison, Luff, who's been on the podium five of the last seven visits here. Canto and Richards. And then the final page, Musket, Kostecki, Perkins, Pither, Hinchcliffe and Jack Smith. Like her?
Yeah, just down here with uh, Will Brown. You're not running away, mate. Now, if you don't know, Will, not only can this kid drive, great character for our sport, so we want him to do well because we want you around. 204.9, mate, really strong across the top. Tell us about that lap, really nice. Yeah, I want to do well as well. I want a main game drive next year, but uh, no, it was awesome. The car is just, uh, makes it pretty easy when you've got a car that good. So I uh, jumped in and Anton set it up great and can't thank the boys enough because, uh, yeah, just wheeling it over the top and uh, they don't tell me anything until I get in here. So it was great to come in and see that we're P1. Mate, really nice. Keep it up, keep it clean and you're in for a great result. Well done, Will. I want to try and grab, this one's of great interest to me, is uh, Lukey Yildon, uh, while he's just having a chat to... Alice McVeigh, the engineer, and Davey Reynolds. Hey, Luke, I thought that was a great job, mate, after what happened to get back on the horse. It's hard, because where you went in, you've got to be committed, and you had to be committed there again today. Yeah, you obviously just don't want to make any more work for the guys. Obviously, they've done their bit, you know what I mean? An awesome job. I can't thank them enough. I can't apologise enough for yesterday as well. I'm normally a pretty safe pair of hands, I think. But anyway, yeah, it was. Um, I, I did battle a little bit mentally going into it. What am I going to do? I, I can't be too slow, and I can't be too aggressive there either. So I just build up to it. I mean, there's, there's plenty more in it, obviously. Um, but, yeah, I, I just wanted to make sure it came back. It was a really nice job, mate. Well done. Yeah, thank you. Cheers. We're back at Mount Panorama for the super cheap auto Bathurst 1000. And McLaughlin comes to the line. Yes! He's done a two minute 3.8. We remember some famous Bathurst.